All right, chapter 10 is about one of my favorite functional groups, the alkyne. Alkynes are pretty awesome. And I did my PhD research project on alkyne chemistry. Chapter 10. So there, there is going to be a portion of this chapter that I will expect you to read at home, simply because I don't think it's um, that complicated and worth class time. So the first thing I want you to review is section 10.1 through 10.3 in your textbook. These sections cover naming or nomenclature and they cover acid-base chemistry. Does anybody remember the unique thing about an alkyne and its pKa? Are alkynes more acidic than alkanes? Yes. Yeah, why is that? Because of hybridization, right? So alkynes are unusually acidic for hydrocarbons, and so there is a brief section on acid-base chemistry, but I, I don't think we're going to spend any time reviewing that just because it's uh, already been covered first term. But what we will do is go over a little bit of preparation. And you guys already know how to make alkynes from chapter 9, which is nice. And this is directly related to elimination chemistry. So if you guys remember, with an E2 reaction, all we need is a halogen as a leaving group. And we can react this with any sort of generic base. And this base will come grab an anticoplanar beta proton we'll clamp down and kick off our leaving group. When we do this, we can do an E2 elimination reaction and we can make an alkene. First term, I gave you guys a pod where we took this one step further. And I told you guys with alkynes, we can do really similar chemistry. But this time we need a dihalide. So I'm going to put two bromines right here. And I'm going to put all three hydrogens on that terminal carbon. So again, we would need a strong base for this reaction to occur. And this base will come grab an anticoplanar beta proton, clamp down and kick off our leaving group. And now we've got a bromine left over and we've got our other two hydrogens left. And I'm just going to label this HB. The starting material that I have listed with the two bromines is called a geminal dihalide. All that means is that both halogens are coming off of that exact same carbon. They're not coming off of different carbons. What do you think the next step is if we add more base? Yeah, we can do another E2 reaction, just like we saw with alkenes. So we can take a second equivalent of base. We can clamp down, and we can kick off our bromine. Why did I grab that proton and not the one on the top right? Yeah, it still has to be anticoplanar for this to work. And we have that leftover proton. And we've got our conjugate acid. What do you think happens if we have excess acid around? Or, sorry, excess base? What's that? Yeah, exactly. We have this acidic proton on the terminal portion of our alkyne. If we do have ex excess base around, we could deprotonate that, but it depends on the strength of our base. This proton has a pKa 
of about 25. So if we choose an appropriate base, we could easily deprotonate that. A common base you'll see a lot in the Klein textbook is sodium amide, that's NaNH2. And if you add too much NaNH2, you'll actually deprotonate that terminal proton and end up with an acetylide where that carbon has a negative charge and a lone pair on it. There's also a slightly different way of making alkynes, so let's briefly cover that. And I think you guys can probably figure this one out. So I'm just going to put a bracket here. And you guys got this on your pod last term, but it's very closely related. But this time, instead of using a geminal dihalide, we call this a vicinal dihalide. Now the bromines are coming off of neighboring carbons, not the same carbon. What's the first step? Yeah, we would do an E2 reaction. So let's say, just for the sake of argument, we're going to grab this proton. We'll clamp down. We'll kick off this leaving group. Now we've got these other protons left. And again, we can do a second E2 reaction with this where again, we've got our base. This can come grab a proton, clamp down, and give us our alkyne. So we can prepare alkynes from vicinal dihalides or geminal dihalides. It doesn't really matter a whole lot, but when we do this method, we're always making a terminal alkyne. No, not really. There's going to be a statistical mixture of that. When I say terminal, what does that mean? Yeah, it's the end. So it means it has a proton coming off of it. It doesn't mean the alkyne is going to die. An internal alkyne means that you've got a carbon-carbon triple bond in between other carbons. So oftentimes you'll hear, hear me refer to internal or terminal alkynes. Just be aware that terminal alkynes always have a proton coming off of the end. Yep. Did you just rotate the Br and H right there on the second intermediate? Yeah, it's important to remember that sigma bonds rotate freely in solution. So I didn't show any stereochemistry with this, but you should be grabbing anti-coplanar beta protons. All right, so let's go on to a little bit of chemistry with alkynes. The first reaction is one that you're pretty familiar with, and this is reduction. Yep. I can't remember, if, I think this was on the quiz. What reagents do we need to get this transformation to work? So we need H2 gas, and we need a catalyst like palladium. And is this addition going to be syn or anti for the hydrogens? Thin. But in this case, it doesn't matter because we don't have stereochemistry. However, there are some cases, like on the quiz, where it does matter. So the two hydrogens add to the same face of the alkene. With alkynes, we get very similar chemistry. What's in the That's a little G for gas. Sorry, my handwriting's not always super good. There we go. With alkynes, we can do something similar. Well, let's just take the analogous alkyne and we're going to treat it with H2 and palladium. We can add hydrogen across. However, one interesting thing with this reaction is we don't observe this intermediate. Oops. What do you think this ultimately goes to if we have enough hydrogen around? Propane. Not propane, we've got four carbons. Butane, exactly. So the hydrogenation of alkynes won't stop at the alkene. It's uncontrollable. Instead, 
the uh, hydrogenation will go all the way to the corresponding alkane. So let's make a, a little note. And the question is, well, what if we want to observe the alkene and not go directly to the alkane? So how can we stop at the alkene? Yep. Yeah, it goes straight from the alkyne to uh, the alkane. It's too hard to control and get it to stop at an alkene, whether or not that's cis or trans. So is there like an alkene transition state, or it just? Uh, in this case, it's not that it doesn't go through an alkyne. It's just it's so uncontrollable. It would be impossible to isolate the alkene in any appreciable amount. Yeah. So if we do want to stop at the alkene and recover it at a much higher yield, we have to trick our catalyst a little bit. And we trick our catalyst by using a poison catalyst. One that doesn't allow that hydrogenation to occur from the alkene to the alkane. The main one that we use is Lindler's catalyst. And Lindler's catalyst involves a heterocycle with two fused rings, and it's aromatic. And then you also have this lead barium sulfate mixture. And typically, this is done in methanol. Good thing for you guys is I'm just going to refer to this as Lindler's catalyst from now on. I won't expect you to draw out all of the different reagents, but it's important to remember that Lindler's catalyst is a mixture of all three of these things. We're not going to go into the mechanistic details behind Lindler's catalyst, but I do want you to know the name of it. The other one that's often used is called a P2 catalyst. And this is a nickel-boron complex with two nickels and one boron. Yeah, it's P-2. And these are really nice poison catalysts. The unique thing with these poison catalysts is that these will only give you one alkene. So I'll show you what I mean by that. Let's take a look at some example reactions. In this first example, I'm going to start out with our internal alkyne. In the first one, we're going to use hydrogen gas and Lindler's catalyst. And Lindler's catalyst is neat because you exclusively get your cis alkene. So the two hydrogens get added across one face you don't observe any trans alkene. So we get regiochemical control and we can exclusively get our cis alkene. And this becomes a really valuable synthetic tool. The P2 catalyst works in the same way where we can take hydrogen gas and we can do our nickel boron complex, and again, we only get our cis alkene out of this. If you remember, cis alkenes are the more natural alkene, um, so you oftentimes have to make these for drugs and pharmaceutical products where trans alkenes may cause problems in your body. However, there are some cases where you do need to get to your trans alkene, so let's go over that really quickly. So trans alkenes. And these go through a pretty different sort of, or they go through a very different sort of mechanism called a dissolving metal reduction.
These reactions are much more difficult to run, but I'll show you how they work briefly. We're not going to cover the full mechanism because it goes through a radical intermediate. But we start with our internal alkyne, and then we take sodium metal. Has anybody ever played around with sodium metal? It catches on fire when it comes into contact with water. It also has the consistency of butter. You can cut through it with a knife really easily. It's a pretty weird sort of metal, and you have to handle it with care. The second thing this reaction does, or is run in, is liquid ammonia. Liquid ammonia is some scary stuff as well. This will dissolve your skin if you spill it on you. So this isn't the most friendly reaction. However, it allows us to access our trans alkene. So we don't observe any of the cis. And let's make the little note, just one second, I'll come back to you guys. It goes through a radical anion intermediate. And we're going to cover radicals in chapter 11. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, what is the Na dot? It's an Na with a little elemental circle in the top right-hand corner. So anytime you see that not symbol in the upper right-hand corner, it just means elemental. It's not charged, so it doesn't have that positive charge that we're used to. Yep. Um, I just wanted to know what's so special about these things that allow them it has a lot to do with the mechanism for this one. If you're interested in it, I would recommend looking at the mechanism in your Klein textbook, but we haven't even begun to cover radicals yet, so I'm going to hold off on the radical mechanism until we get there. As far as the poison catalysts go, they, I, to be perfectly honest, I'm not quite sure how they work um, so that they exclusively stop at the alkene. But because they occur at an interface, they can only add the hydrogen syn to one another, never anti. So you exclusively get cis. I believe the way they work is that their activation energy for that second hydrogenation of the alkene to the alkane is just simply too high. But the alkyne that you start with is very reactive. And so it'll go from the alkyne to the alkene, but not the alkene to the alkane. Yeah. All right, so let's make a little summary chart, and then I'll let you guys head out. If we've got an alkyne and we want to go straight to the alkane, what reagent could I use? H2. Yep. I could use hydrogen and I could use palladium. Simple enough. Exact same reaction we just covered with alkenes. What if I want to go to the cis alkene? What reagent could I use? Same. Yeah, exactly. So we would use H2. And Lindler's catalyst. And then if we want to go from the alkene to the alkane, what could I use? Oh, we could just use our old reaction from last chapter, right? So we could reduce that alkene if we wanted to. However, if we want to go to our trans alkene, <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to use a different set of reagents. What reagent would we need to go to our trans alkene? Sodium. Yeah, sodium metal, and what else? Uh, yeah, liquid ammonia. And then if we want to go from our alkene to our alkane, we can use hydrogen gas and palladium, platinum, or nickel. Any of those will work. So as you can see, a lot of these reactions look really similar to last term. Tomorrow when we come in, we'll cover... Uh, halogenation of alkenes or alkynes, and they go through very similar mechanisms to um, chapter nine. All right, I'll see some of you guys in lab. Uh, let me know if you guys have any questions.